and a uh, at home prayer. We'll get started here. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, we'll continue with our hymn of the month. Stricken Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And Luther's morning prayer, I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. And let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Uh, so on the uh, hymn for today, uh, there's one more thing I want to point out about the sin because we're uh, at the end of the month here. And uh, next week I think we'll probably start a uh, Easter hymn of some kind. Um, so the thing I want to talk about real quick is the way that the hymn references Jesus. So there's a number of different names by which Jesus goes in the Bible, actually many, many names by which Jesus is called in the Bible when you include all the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament especially. Um, but it, it is uh, interesting the way that the hymnody kind of picks up on this and plays with it. So uh, just rolling through here, there's, there's quite a few. Um, obviously Christ is, is kind of the main one. Um, and Christ, remember, is not just a name, but it's a title. Uh, Christ is the anointed one, the Messiah, the one that was uh, promised in the, in the Old Testament. That's kind of the main prophetic name of Jesus is uh, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that's, that's promised. Um, I, I don't know how popular it still is, but I know... Um, one com somewhat common misconception is that Christ is like Jesus' last name, right? Especially in the kind of secular world, that's who Jesus Christ. Um, but no, it's a, it's not that; it's a title. Jesus is his name. Um, that's the name given by the angel for Joseph and Mary to call him. Uh, the title is is Christ, and um, so we have Christ first of all. Um, the long-expected prophet. Okay, so it's a reference to uh, Deuteronomy 18. David's son, yet David's Lord. Um, that's a reference to when Jesus is talking to the... I believe he's talking to the Sadducees at that point, actually. Maybe he's talking to Pharisees. Anyway, um, and he says, who, who do you say that the Messiah is? How, how is it that David says... Um, they, and they say David's son, and he says... Well, how is it that David calls him Lord and, and preaches on Psalm 110? Uh, so David's son, yet David's Lord. Um, and then uh, finally at the end of stanza one, we get this thing that's kind of picked up on later in the hymn, "'Tis the true and faithful word." Um, and that's, of course, a reference to John 1, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father. Um, that's from John 1, 1 and, and uh, John 1, 14. And uh, this idea that Jesus is the word of God um, is very important, right? So first of all, uh, we can see that, in that, that the triune God, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the same God all the way from Genesis 1 through the end of Revelation. Right, there is, uh, you know, oftentimes throughout church history, people have been confused about the two testaments and said or thought that um, there's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God, right? The God of wrath and the God of grace, or something like that. And uh, that's simply not true. It's the same triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, from the beginning, right? And the so we have the Jesus called the Word. Well, how does how does God? Um, Create in the beginning. 
while he speaks creation, right? And it's through Jesus that all things are created, um, as we learn in, in Colossians, and the Spirit is there hovering over the waters, right? So it's the same God. Um, also, how does, how does Jesus come to us? He comes to us by the Word, right? He comes to us in himself by his Word. Um, and you, so you can never separate these things, right? How, how can they believe who have not heard, and how can they hear if someone doesn't preach the word to them? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. That's Romans 10. Um, the word of Christ, the word is Christ, and you, you simply cannot separate those things. He, come, he is present in his word, and he, got, he is the word, um, the word made flesh. Uh, so we have this idea of the word here, and um, the, so in stanza three, the one I wanted to point out is Son of Man and Son of God. Um, so you get that in hymnody uh, oftentimes. So like in Beautiful Savior, for instance, uh, the, there's this reference Son of Man and Son of God. And oftentimes when people use that phrase in conjunction like that, Son of Man and Son of God, what they're trying to show about Jesus is that he's both man and God. And that's completely true. Um, and interestingly, if, if you read the Gospels, Jesus, do you know what Jesus' favorite title for himself is? The one that Jesus himself calls himself most often when he's talking about the Messiah? Yeah, Son of Man. Yeah, he, said, he always says the Son of Man um, when he's talking to like his disciples or to the Pharisees or whatever. Um, now, what's interesting about that is that Son of Man is not actually a reference to his humanity. It's um, a reference, let me see if I can remember, I, I don't think I remember the chapter. Um, and, but it's a reference to the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, there's uh, a couple messianic prophecies that um, deal with the Son of Man that's going to be raised up. And so it's actually a reference more to his divinity than to, than to, than to his humanity. Um, but yet it, uh, it does work because he is the son of man. He is, he is the son of God who is born as the son of man. So um, that one's kind of interesting as well. Um, but the word, so tis the word, the Lord's anointed son of man and son of God. Um, and then finally in, in stanza four we get Christ the rock of our salvation, lamb of God, her sinners wounded. Right, so we get all these names for Christ. Now, if you look in stanza four, right in the middle, um, where after Christ, the rock of our salvation, I think, and you can take all of these names kind of in total, is the name by of which we boast. So, when you're thinking about all these names of Christ and everything that they mean, so that he's the God of creation, that he's the second person of the Trinity, that he is the one that was prophesied from the pool. That he is the one who's both man and God. That he's the perfect Lamb of God. That he's spotless. That um, he is the Word made flesh. All of these things, when we look at that and then we look at the cross, it helps us to see, I think, how amazing the cross is. Right? That this true God, God in the flesh, this Jesus Christ, this Lamb, this Word, this true God, um, this is the name by, of which we boast, the one who bared the awful load on the cross. Um, and so uh, it's right for us, uh, especially during Lent and, and coming into Holy Week here, uh, to consider all these ideas about Christ and who he is and what he's done, right? I, th I often think of Lent kind of like God. Um, just a time of focus, right? So I can't, there it is. That's the one I was looking for. Right, so during the church year, you know, we're thinking about a lot of different, throughout the entire church year, we think about all sorts of different ideas and aspects of the Christian faith. But during Lent, right, we're really getting down to the meat and the center of exactly what is our theology. And that is, and that is the cross, right? So we're kind of, this is Lent, we're, um, this is the time when we're focusing in, right? This is where our eyes are, is, is on Jesus on the cross. And um, who is 
that Jesus, and what does that cross mean? Right, that's the question. And so, um, anyway, I think this hymn is great because so far we've talked a lot about what the cross means, right? Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, the awful load, um, all these things. But mixed into all of that in this hymn is this beautiful theology of who Jesus is, right? So, um, anyway, any questions or thoughts on, on that? Yeah, go ahead, Gary. You know the, the movie, you know, The Passion of Christ? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that Hollywood thought you had to make it so vivid and so hard to, you know, even take to make people understand. But I think Christian didn't need it for it to be that. They understood, you know, the, what he had gone through. And I think that's the big point that people have to understand. They have to believe in him first before they can understand a lot of those things in the Bible. They just don't make, you know, they don't fit together until you believe in him first. Yeah, I think, um, so I talked about the uh, Action of the Christ movie the, that Mel Gibson produced. Um, I think best construction is that it was produced by Christians so that non-Christians could could encounter the idea of the of the passion of of the idea of atonement um, and and get a and then for Christians to just get a uh, to help them imagine you know what what it was like um, certainly for one Christians survived for hundreds and thousands of years without having a Hollywood movie to tell us, right? Um, and, of course, we have we have the word, which is what we need. We don't need a movie. Well, but, they, had, they had so many strange things happen in that pr production of that movie, too. You know, things mm -hmm. happen. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, that people, you know, it happened to people and stuff like that. So, I mean, if they were trying to really Mm -hmm. make people understand what it was all about. I, I think there were a lot of things that happened that... You know, yeah, it's interesting, yeah. I don't know, I honestly just don't know too much about it. Y'all know that I'm not a big, like, Hollywood guy. I'm not good at that stuff. Well, I know when we watched it here at church, after we watched it, nobody nobody even spoke. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I saw it once a long time ago, but um, I, I've heard how, you know, moving it is, and I always think every Holy Week, like, oh, I should, we should watch that, I should watch that, but... Um, yeah, anyway, I mean, I think it's overall good. I've never heard of anyone's faith being harmed by it or anything. I, I think uh, most of the time it's, you know, a blessing to people in some way. And, um, you know, as far as unbelievers go, if they watch it, um, it definitely might make them think and might encourage them to go and hear the gospel preached. And, and you know, that's, that's definitely good. So, um but yeah, otherwise, I mean, uh, I I have no issue with it really. I think. Um, well, I, can, I don't think I can watch it again. Yeah, but I I think you're right. I think Christians do <laughs> Christians do rightly recognize the meaning of the cross. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, we do always need to be reminded of that as well, right? right. So. Yeah. I, you know, growing up uh, Protestant, though, to that point, you know, we always had an empty cross. And uh, something that I find in, in Lutheranism that I very much cherish, which obviously is something odd for Lutheranism because they've swapped in everybody, is, they, uh, is, is the crucifix. Um, you know, many people say, oh, that's too Catholic, that's too Catholic. But, you know, we, we look upon them, you know, bruised. Smitten, you know, stricken, and it's beautiful. It's it's terrible, and that's why it's beautiful. Right. Yeah. No, I I concur. I think that um, having the image of the crucifix is is important. Um, just and especially because our in modern American Christianity has become so what? Um, yeah. Clean. Clean, right? It's you know, see, it, you know, starting in the '90s with like seeker-sensitive movements, uh, it's all about not offending anybody, and it's like, well, Paul says in First Corinthians that uh, the cross is a stumbling block, and to the Jews, and, and it's foolishness to the Gentiles, right? The cross is offensive, um, of course, of course it is. So, um, it's it's scandalous, and. Uh, I mean, we're going to look, we're going to, in the sermon today, we're looking at the sacrifice of Isaac, 
which is a foretelling of, of, the, crucifix, of the crucifixion of the father slaying his son. And that is scandalous, in a sense. Yeah. So, um, and yet it's our salvation. It's how God worked out salvation. And, of course, he didn't leave him dead, right? Part of the point is that he used that to, to forgive sin and then raised him from the dead, um, that we would be justified. So, uh, let's move on to the ninth commandment. So, um, the catechism, remember, we're from the ninth commandment, you shall not cover your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance in our house or get them away which only appears right. But help him be of service to him in keeping it. So, um, one thing to note, of course, is that the ninth and tenth commandments go together. And there's a whole issue of um, why we number the commandments the way we do, because there's basically two traditions of numbering the commandments. Because we have this problem in the Bible where there's basically eleven commandments, but Moses said he only received ten. So we got this list of eleven, and we're like, okay, which two are we going to combine together? And uh, Lutherans and Catholics combine the first two of the eleven together, and uh, Eastern Orthodox and, Pro and other Protestants um, combine the last two together and separate out the first, the first two. So whatever, it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, we believe the Bible, right? So we believe all of them. Yes. Do we know what the uh, Jewish tradition was? Um, it depends on what you, you mean. Uh, the modern Jews, I believe, fall in line with, I, I think they're actually even a little bit different. They do something even a little bit different, but they're closer to the, like the Eastern Orthodox, other Protestant tradition. But, um, I, so the problem with Judaism, look, so the, this is a very common, like, idea is, well, if we want to know what, like, it was, like, meant to be, we should look at, like, Jewish tradition because they would, like, have preserved all the way back into the Old Testament. The problem is Jewish tradition is not good at preserving things. They actually change their opinions and minds and traditions all the time. So, I know, like, I, I always sidestep yeah. the problem and say, well, they're not numbered in the Bible, so, you know, you just, right, have, no, they're just have to read them and yeah. read them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, like, really the reason we have them numbered is um, for teaching purposes, right? So that we can just teach about them and be like, oh, like, for, you know, with our kids, right? Like, when someone steals a toy, we're like, Seventh Commandment, you know? So they, it's just a good teaching tool. Anyway, but, I, I, so with all that said, I think that it's actually good that we separate the Ninth and Tenth Commandments in some ways because it does give us some different things to talk about. So one of the, the big distinctions between Ninth and Tenth is that um, we have inanimate objects and animate objects. We have uh, the house, and then we have um, wife, servants, and livestock, um, which we can talk about that next week. But when it comes to the house, I think it's, um, I was thinking about, okay, why, why house, right? Why doesn't he, God just say possessions? And I think that the house is um, actually very important. Uh, the idea of a, a house or especially a home. So just a, just a couple of things. One, if you think about like society in general, and if you think about kind of political philosophy and the tradition traditions of political philosophy, which politics just means how do we live together? Um, polis is just word for city, how do we, how do we live together? Um, the basis of any society is a family unit, right? A home. And um, having a property or a house or a home where you live, um, our, our modern world doesn't understand this as well just because of like rental economies and um, how mobile people are since the automobile. But uh, traditionally, like throughout most of history, human history, the idea of like having property and having a house and having a home 
um, or even a homestead, is the idea of having a life, right? And then when you have multiple of these homes or home units or house units, uh, then you have a society, right? You have a larger family and then you have, um, you know, what is the church? How do we keep track of membership in the church? It's by family units, by home units, right? Um, how, and how, do, how does the government keep track of people? It's by family units, right? And uh, even the founding fathers, um, some of them, right, before it was in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you remember what it was? Liberty and the pursuit of property. Yeah, right, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. That you could come to this land, and then it would be a, a right that you could pursue having a home, having a house. Right? And so uh, that's not to say that if you don't own a house or you own a property today that you're like somehow like not as good, right? I mean, um, it's God provides in a variety of ways. And um, like I said, obviously with mod the modern economy and um, the mobility of people today being so different than it was traditionally, um, some of that doesn't apply as much. But the idea there is that um, God is protecting someone's life, his livelihood, right? And his ability to be a full human in a sense, right? Um, so one way to think of the commandments is what is God protecting, right? So in the sixth commandment, God's protecting marriage, right? In the seventh commandment, he's protecting possessions. In the eighth commandment, he's protecting reputation. Um, and in the Ninth Commandment, I think he's protecting someone's life, right, in some ways, right? We, in the Fifth Commandment, he's protecting life physically. In the Ninth Commandment, he's protecting the life of the home, right, the life of the house. And so um, I, think that's, I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, I, I never really thought of it that way before, and I was just pondering, okay, why house? So... Anyhow, uh, any questions or comments on that? Any thoughts? Does that sound good? I, like I said, it's just it's a pretty neat, new thought to me, so it's, but uh, it kind of makes sense. So, all right, let's uh, open up to Second Chronicles twenty six. We are finally at the time of the kingdom of Judah with the kings of Judah, <coughs> when Isaiah is reign is uh, prophesied, and. Um, since we've been going through the book of Isaiah during Lent, I was hoping we could kind of connect that with Bible study more um, and just haven't ever been able to, but that's okay. Uh, you know the book of Isaiah hopefully a lot better now than you did a couple weeks ago, and um, now this will give it even a little more context. So um, last week we finished up Amaziah, and... Amaziah was one of these kings that started good and then ended not so good. The same is going to be true with Uzziah, although he's not going to end as bad. He's not as miserable of a failure um, as Amaziah was. You know, Am Amaziah got just way too greedy and ended up getting killed by conspirators because he refused to back down from a military fight, um, which was just kind of a stupid life decision, right? Um, and... Uh, Uzziah is going to make a dumb life decision, but his is going to be more in terms of worship than a military. So that's that's kind of interesting. Um, but he does uh, basically remain faithful, um, although he is still punished for his mistake. So uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But, okay, um, the, his life actually starts out very, very well. So... For, he's 16 when he becomes king after his father Amaziah is assassinated. And um, he follows in the footsteps of these good kings. And so notice, remember with the book of Isaiah, okay? So with Isaiah, Uzziah, um, we get Uzziah's reference in Isaiah 1 that Isaiah prophesied in the time of Uzziah. And then... Um, that's when he started being a prophet. And then Isaiah 6, which is Isaiah in the temple with the seraphim and the burning coal and all that. You know the story, right? Um, that is the year that King Uzziah dies. So um, 
Isaiah is not doing a lot of prophecy during this time, but um, what you can notice here is kind of the general trajectory of Judah at the time and how that's going to match up or not match up with Isaiah's prophecy. Okay, so Isaiah starts out a very good king. Um, verse 2, he built Aleph and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his father. Um, 16, when he becomes king, uh, he sought God in the days of Zechariah. This is verse 5. Now, this is not the Zechariah who's got a book of the Bible, by the way. That Zechariah is at um, a much later date, I believe. Um, this is another prophet, Zechariah, who we don't know really anything about. Um, we don't know who it is. Um, but he is, so automatically, right, we got right word. He's listening to the prophets um, who had understandings and visions of God, and he's seeking the Lord, and, and God made him prosper. Okay? And now he's going to, this is going to be reminiscent of um, of Solomon and David. Uh, he, made, he went and, and made war with the Philistines. Broke down the wall of Gath. Um, and basically he goes on and he had all these military successes. Right? So his father, Amaziah, did not have very good military success. Um, when, especially after he stopped listening to the Lord. But Uzziah goes on, he has a lot of military success. And the kingdom is expanding. Right? So he's going and, and bringing the cities back in. Um, the Ammonites are bringing tribute to Uzziah. It's verse 8. And um, he's kind of becoming famous, and they're coming extremely strong, right, all the way up to the entrance of Egypt. Um, so he built towers in Jerusalem, right? Uh, he built towers, and uh, notice also in verse 10, he dug many wells, and he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains, and he had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. So one of the things you can see when things are going well in a place is not just churches, right? So basically, you know, throughout the history of Judah, you got you got Christian churches, uh, you got people who are coming to the temple and offering the right sacrifices, and um, you got people following the Lord's law, and then you got these false altars, right? You got these non-Christian churches, basically, right? Where there's um, being false, false sacrifice being offered, Canaanite worship, all these things. And one of the big telltale signs of how good a king is is if he raises up Christian places and tears down non-Christian places, um, and so on and so forth. But if you just think about like economy and how well a kingdom is doing, um, there's got to be economic activity, right? Uh, same, you know, people. People talk this way about America, like um, one of the problems we have in America right now is we don't make stuff anymore, right? China makes it, <laughs> right? So, um, I mean, some people consider that a problem, some people don't, but um, historically speaking, if you're not being productive as a society, you got to think, okay, what do we have to offer, right? How, how, how are we going to... Uh, um, be able to defend ourselves, how we're going to be able to provide for ourselves, so on and so forth. And um, so I think it's noteworthy that in the days of Uzziah, the economy is good, right? He's building stuff. He's farming, right? Um, and, and he uh, notices the value of that. He loves the soil. Okay. Um, so he's got an army, fighting men, so on and so forth. Um, Anyway, things are going very, very well. Okay. Uh, so, consider Isaiah at this point. What's Isaiah's message in Isaiah 1 and 2? His message is that Judah is a bloodthirsty people mm. and that they are a wicked people. <laughs> And that they need to repent and turn to God before they go into exile. That does not actually match up with what seems to be going on at the time. And that is very interesting to me. Um, I think that it makes total sense, even though it, it doesn't match up. Right? Because 
this is something that's very common in both Christians' lives as individuals and in church history, is that whenever people get overconfident, right, whenever things seem to be going well in all the externals, that's when people fall, right? Um, and you, you see this, like, that's the cycle of judges, right? So think, uh, to use a historical example, think about the judges, right? What happens in the judges? Things are going well for Israel. Because they're going well, they start to mix themselves up with the Canaanites. They fall into sin, and then God punishes them, and then they repent, and then he sends them another judge to raise them back up, and they start doing well again, and the second they start doing well again, they fall back down. So as a prophet, Isaiah knows this, right? Isaiah knows that things are not going to continue to go well. And that plays itself out in the course of the history, right? Um, but you can see in the beginning of Isaiah, um, Isaiah is kind of nervous to, to take this call, right? So like, you know, he's a pastor, this church calls him, except it's, you know, God, the voice of God, which is, you know, you can't really say no to. Um, <laughs> Just <too> much. <laughs> yeah. And he's, uh, <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm, I'm not sure about this. Lord, uh, so you can read about this in Isaiah 1 and 2. And, um, <coughs> you know, that kind of makes sense, right? Um, so if I got a, if I got a call to like some really big successful church and, but the Lord came and told me like, you go preach fire and brimstone to them, <laughs> I'd be like, ah, this just doesn't seem right. You know? <laughs> but, um, that's what, that's basically what's going on. So. Um, anyway, Uzziah's kingdom is strong, and, and this is the, the kingdom Isaiah prophesies to. Um, but Isaiah, so think about this too then. Isaiah probably looks pretty insane. Because um, he kind of comes and starts prophesying to Israel right, um, right at the end of Uzziah's reign. So Uzziah dies, um, and then Jotham is going to reign. We're going to talk about that next week. And uh, that's when Isaiah really kicks off. Um, and really from, if you know, in the structure of the book of Isaiah, it's after chapter 6 that the doom and gloom really, really gets going. Um, so he's kind of coming in at the peak of Judah and starts prophesying all this doom and gloom. And um, if you saw him or heard him, right, you'd think, like, this guy's off his rocker. Like, like we're worshiping the word, we're Lord in the temple. Like, things are going well. Um, what, are you, what are you talking about? Isaiah, so um, he'd, he'd probably be considered insane. And the the, uh, the thing to think about with that is that if I ever sound insane, you know I'm probably right. Okay, so I'm I'm just saying, you know, next time <laughs> next time I'm preaching, you know, like no, th there's no way. That's a <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just, it's Warning. just a Warning. general idea that you might want to keep in mind. <laughs> that if, you're, if your preacher ever sounds kind of insane, like, why why is he preaching such fire and brimstone? Things seem well. Maybe they're not. Um, but that, that's how things go, right? The prophets always seem kind of insane, and then they end up being... Right. Yeah, so, um, all right. So, um, Isaiah, or Isaiah's downfall. So we got about yeah eight minutes here to do Isaiah's downfall. So this is actually a microcosm of exactly what we just talked about. That when someone thinks things are going really, really well, then they get too prideful and they fall. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is the basic like proverbial wisdom in the Bible. Pride goeth before the fall. Um, I have a five-year-old son who is very prideful sometimes. I tell them this all the time. Pride goeth before the fall. Um, sometimes literally falls. <laughs> and he gets too proud. Uh, so Isaiah's like, things are, are great. I'm going to go worship the Lord in the temple. And you know what? I can do what the priests do even better than the priests do. 
And so uh, he's strong. And so right, verse 16, when he was strong in his heart, um, he transgressed. Um, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple to burn incense on the altar of incense. Okay, so there are things that were specifically given for the priests to do. Things that were given for kings to do. They're not supposed to mix and match, right? Um, that this is is not a uh, you know custom uh, make your own story type of situation. This is um, there are Lord's commands about what's supposed to happen in the temple and what's not. And so he goes and he is like just so excited about how great things are going, and he thinks he's going to alter incense on the altar of the Lord. Well, Azariah the priest comes in after him with 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. Now, this is great. I mean, this is the this is when you want to be a priest in the Old Testament, right? Um, you got 81 priests coming in, all strapped and ready to go in their in their vestments. Um, and they come up against the king and they say, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense for the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You have, you shall have no honor from the Lord God. Now, this is also an act of courage, right? I mean, it's like this would make a great well, movie yeah, scene. They were the king. But yeah, the king. this is the king, right? He's got. We just heard how powerful his army is, right? If he wanted to, he could wipe out. Wipe, yeah, wipe out the priest. <laughs> you know, Mr. President. Um, but they, yeah, right. He's basically, you know. Um, telling the yeah the president of the country uh, to to get out of the sanctuary. It's, actually, this is a great uh, application of that. Is whenever that Roman Catholic priest denied Joe Biden communion because he supports abortion, that's that took some that took courage. Some, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Some cojones. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I almost said something else, but yeah. <laughs> we know which one. <laughs> you know, is there anybody in the federal government that you would commune? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have time for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's another discussion. Yeah. <laughs> that's for seminary professors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah. That's a rhetorical question. There's no answer. Um, anyway. <laughs> Aside, yeah, that, but that's that, yeah, that's kind of a good uh, analogy there. Um, except in in their day, they actually just would like you know kill people for doing something, right. you know. Yeah. Now nowadays it's all like political or whatever, you know, it gets caught up in courts and things. But back in the day, you know, just pull out the swords, you know, let's go. But uh, that anyway. So Isaiah. Um, does something he's not supposed to do in the temple. And, um, but then, so, the, the priests do this, this very courageous thing, and uh, what happens is that right away, in that moment, Uzziah becomes leprous. Okay, so, and Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there was on his forehead, he was leprous. So they thrust him out of the place, okay, because he really can't be in the temple now, right? When you you're unclean when you have yeah. leprosy. Yeah. He can't be in the temple. Um, now, King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. Um, he, so he he saw that the Lord had struck him. Indeed, he hurried to get out because he saw that the Lord had struck him. So he realized that he had gotten leprosy. In there. He realized he had messed up. Right? He, was, he had to get out. So he, he got out. And, and um, until the day of his death, he had to dwell in an isolated house because he was a leper. And he was cut off from the house of the Lord, and Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. So even though he was still king, technically, um, his son, Jotham, started ruling as king. Okay, um, And then he eventually died and rested with his fathers, um, and they buried him in his father. So I, mean, I think he was still a Christian okay, at this time. So one thing to realize is, so he did sin. Um, assumedly, he repented. Um Leprosy is not sinful, right, in itself. Leprosy is uncleanness. 
Um, and that gets into the, the theology of cleanness, which we can talk about um, in a minute if you want. But what I, what I want to talk about is I want to go back to the uh, idea of why was him offering incense such a bad thing, right? Because I think um, in, the in the church, we think of God primarily as merciful, and that is 100% right. That's good. God is merciful, and God does forgive sins, and God is very kind and gracious, right? He has grace. He has favor towards his people. That is not always the same thing, and it should not be the same thing or considered the same thing as God being a nice guy, right? So when it comes to how we do things in the church, and I'm talking about primarily in worship, um, to think that, oh, well, God is a nice guy. God's gracious. He's merciful, right? Like, it doesn't really matter what we do. That would be a mistake. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, okay, right? So, God does, even though God is merciful and kind, right? And he doesn't, um, I mean, he doesn't just strike down Uzziah right there, right? Um, he doesn't just, you know, send a lightning strike and blow him to smithereens, right? He doesn't rain down fire from heaven, which he could. He has before. Um, he strikes him with leprosy to get him to get out and to do the right thing. But it's not like he says, oh, it's okay. It doesn't really matter if kings offer incense, right? No, this is important. And the reason it's important is because God has given certain things for certain people to do in the church. And the same is true in the New Testament. Now, it's not true to the same degree, right? There's not as many rules about what sacrifices we offer and when and all this stuff. But if you look at instance for uh, like 1 Timothy 3, at like pastors, okay? So like one of the big distinctions we have in the New Testament is pastors and lay people. Pastors have to meet certain qualifications to be a pastor. And then they are given to do certain things in the church that lay people are not given to do. And that's not because like, oh, God doesn't like lay people or... Because, oh, God's, like, not a nice guy, and so, like, why doesn't he let um, other people administer the Lord's Supper? Or something like that. It's because there's order in his church. And because he also wants reverence. He wants us to revere him. And, and to respect his power and authority. And to respect the way that he set things up. And so, um, the reason that we do church the way we do church here... Like, the reason I wear funny clothes and because and chant and, and that do all the things that we do, right, that someone on the outside might say, that's overkill, <laughs> right? Um, the reason we do that stuff is, is simply because we're trying to be reverent, right? We're trying to do things the way, um, of course, that are in the Bible, right? And if you look in our bulletins um, along every piece of the liturgy, is a Bible reference, right? So we're trying to be very biblical. We're also just staying within church tradition because, not because I'm afraid God's gonna strike us down or because I'm afraid we're gonna get leprosy or something like that if we don't, but, but yeah, but why not, right? Um, and, and also, yeah, no, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Why not um, do the best that we can, right? Why not try and stay within the bounds that have been passed down from generation to generation. Why not be as reverent as we can? Why not uh, give God our absolute best, right? Um, and of course someone could say, oh, well, everyone's trying their best. They're just doing it their own way or whatever. Well, Uzziah tried to do something in his own way that he thought was a good thing to do, right? Offering incense is a good thing to do. He tried to do it his own way. But that wasn't the way that the Lord wanted, right? And so let's, you know, not quibble over, um, oh, let's try, let's try something new because it seems like it'd be fun or nice or different or whatever. Like, let's just do what we do. Let's just do what's been passed down. Let's do what's been Yeah. So I have a question. Question two is actually kind of a two more question. One, so does that <clears throat> exclude, like, say, if I have my prayer time 
a lot of incense, so I shouldn't offer incense at my prayer time? No, because the uh, offering of incense is, that is specifically, so things do change between the Old and New Testament is what I'm getting at. Um, the offering of incense by priests as a command of the Lord is specifically part of the ritual law of the Old Testament, which is fulfilled in Christ and no longer a law in the New Testament. And so you're free to offer incense. So we do have more free. I, there's no doubt we have more freedom in the New Testament. Um, you know, and, and there are things that are like, look, if you can't do this, it's still better to worship than not worship. Just worship the best you can, right? So not everyone, like, not every pastor can chant very well, right? Now, chanting is good. Chanting is within church tradition. Chanting is something that's been passed down. But if a pastor can't chant, and he's still qualified to be a pastor, because chanting is not a qualification in the Bible to be a pastor or not, then that pastor can speak the liturgy reverently, and it's fine. Right, so we do have more freedom in the New Testament than the ritual laws of the Old Testament, and we can use things more freely, like incense and whatnot. But um, the point is to do things the best we can and as reverently as possible. So. But but in personal devotions, yeah, I mean you can you can do that however reverently you you, you see fit. Um, and the incense is free you know? it's not bound in the way that it was in the Old Testament uh, and so one of the things <clears throat> that you hear in the modern <laughs> argument now is Christian nationalism does, does that um, the kings being forbidden to offer incense is that a, a, on the altar is that a well, a directive to separation between church and state. Um, that is a much larger question that I can't cover in negative five minutes, which is what we have for Bible study. <laughs> but um, there is an application of that to what I, I, I don't want to call the separation of church and state because that has way too much baggage with it for me to explain right now. But um, what I would say, the, we would describe as Lutherans the two kingdoms, God's right hand kingdom and God's left hand kingdom. Um, very, very quickly and basically that um, I, I don't think that Jeffersonian separation of church and state is what Lutherans believe. But there is a separation in the sense that Yes, gov like government officials are not church officials and vice, well not, well, yeah. Government officials are not meant, in, in, if you have a Christian nation, which I think is a good thing, um, that doesn't mean that government officials are officials in the church. And it doesn't mean that church officials are necessarily officials in the government. Um, the separation of church and state, even as it's historically been understood by Americans, is to protect the worship of the proclamation of the church, not the other way around. So, um, anyway, I, I can go further into that later. We can talk about it later, but I'll leave it at that. Okay. Care about I mean, if you care to answer, you can email me or whatever. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. History yeah. of Sweden. Because? Yeah. History of Sweden. Yeah, Gary. You know, I brought up. I put a before you on the military situation. If you're in a military situation, they said it would be. That's one thing I was told us we give communion to the dying soldier. And he asked me. Yeah, I would be more concerned with if he's baptized or not. Um, and I'd be, I would just be talking to him about his salvation and about him. Because communion. The other thing you got to think about practically is communion is to celebrate communion. You got to have bread and wine on hand, and you got and you got to say the say the words of institution and all that. Wrong. It was. It may have been baptism. Yeah, I think baptism is much more important because baptism is actually salvific. 
Um, forgive, the, the Lord's Supper contains the forgiveness of sins and it's communion with Jesus, but it's not salvific in the way that baptism is. So I'd say baptism is emergency, communion is not emergency. All right, um, let's say a very quick prayer, and uh, we got church in six minutes, so I got to get going. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless our worship today. We thank you for giving us your word today, and we pray that you would continue to be with us in all that we do. We pray this in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.